me out there in the world of ice and fireland. All right. Maybe we are Everyone, moving. can you hear me? So, out how's there it going, everyone? In, in the, the world chat, of ice we got a special edition of Nooners of Ice and Fire today with our special guest, Nick K, the geophysicist. We're going to be talking everything geology as far as the world of ice and fire. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Sorry, people. Uh, I had no issue there. Anyways. <laughs> I apologize. I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Susie Burns introduce herself while I get my stuff situated. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. You know who I am because I'm John on Johnny's channel almost every single week or every single day, almost it seems like nowadays. You can find me on my channel. And on Tuesday, we're going to be starting episode what I like to call episode club, where we are going to be taking each episode of a Game of Thrones and analyzing it. And I happen to have two people who will be on it with me. And I believe Elmar, who's in the chat, she'll be on it with me as well. And we're going to be going over the first episode called Winter is Coming. And I hope you guys come and join us. Go ahead, Johnny or Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, I just want to apologize. Uh, the OBS lag took control of my mind, and I just got stupid for a second. But this is going to be a special presentation by me on a lot of the science of planetos or Westeros. It's not officially planetos, but uh, Milt's going to really inform us today. So take it away, Milt. Tell them who you are and what you're going to be doing today. Hey guys, it's Milk from the uh, Citadel of Trivia. That's probably where you guys will see me uh, every other week, just basically hosting a trivia stream. I'm also on various other streams, and this is the first time uh, I'll be on uh, Johnny B. Crazy's channel, so thanks a lot, Johnny, for having me on. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is basically uh, something that, you know, sort of a rehash of what I streamed about six months ago, uh, talking about, you know, the science behind the Doom, Doom of Valeria, but I'm, I'll try to expand it a little more. Uh, to the Doom of Valeria, as well as uh, the Breaking of the Armor Dorn, and kind of implications for the uh, Long Night, and what I think's happening with the Long Night. That still needs to be worked on. Um, so, so the title of this is really, it's really, you know, trying to break down, okay, what happened uh, with the natural disasters of Planetos, and whether or not these things can be explained by science or magic, or neither, or a combination of both, we don't know. Uh, Planetos is a kind of an interesting word, considering that I checked it yesterday. It hasn't even been mentioned anywhere in the uh, Song of Ice and Fire lore. So Planetos is, is evidently a fan created a name for the world of Ice and Fire, which I thought was pretty interesting because you know everybody always talked about Planetos as being like the world that they live in, but that's not necessarily true. Anyway, uh, so in this in this presentation, I'll be going through. Um, some figures and some and some observations from the books as well as um from uh previous work uh made by some of the guys that i've knowledge below in that lower left hand corner of the screen uh, miles Trare. he's a uh, scientist from uh, stanford who's done a lot of work on trying to uh, reconstruct the geological history of uh, planetos and then uh, grab, grab some figures from the atlas of ice and fire blog and lastly uh there's some random figures that I kind of like Googled, Googled around for uh, kind of like miscellaneous figures, but they're pretty good figures. So I don't know who did them, but other than uh, Google, had them available for me to copy. So anyway, so at the risk of uh, droning on and on, let's get started now with uh, the Doom of Valeria. So essentially a uh, really cool picture, a big dragon is going to die pretty soon. Uh, so what really happened in the Doom of Valeria? Well, basically what we know is that there was a volcanic cataclysm, right, that occurred about 400, 400 years before the events of a, of a Game of Thrones. Okay, so, um, you no, know, one of the quotes from the World Book is that, you know, every hill for 500 miles exploded, filling the air with ash and smoke and fire from the 14 flames, which killed all the dragons that were flying around. Uh, for scale, I have two maps in the upper right-hand corner here. One is the uh, map of 
Planetos and where Valerius sits. So it's basically in the southern part of Essos. And uh, basically that little circle represents the Valerian Peninsula. And, you know, for 500 miles for another scale is that if you look at the United States, pretty much that's kind of like the 500 mile radius of the United States. So basically it covers Texas all the way out to uh, Alabama, north to Nebraska and west to uh, Arizona. So it's a pretty big area. Okay, um, that's for scale for everybody. That's for context for everybody. I think your sound might be a little low on your end. Okay, is that better? I, I don't know, but um, okay. that'll let me know. Cool, okay. Uh, and uh, the third point is that, you know, the hills split asunder and that the waves and the sea whipped and churned. Uh, and, you know, all that stuff is associated with volcanic activity and or seismic activity. And then a couple of maps you see in the bottom uh, right hand side shows you the before uh, picture of what the Valerian Peninsula looked like. Then afterwards, you see it kind of being busted apart with a big, uh, almost, you know, a big straight line where the 14 flames were. So um, those are the maps got fragmented and basically in that all the waters inside of the out of the old Valerian uh, Peninsula, they uh, they are referred to as the Smoking Sea. You know, basically, supposedly any ships that go through them uh, basically disappear or the crew just dies for whatever reason. I got my theories on why they die. Right, and didn't mm -hmm. uh, who was that that flew with the dragon? One of the last dragon lords flew a dragon with thirty thousand men down to Valyria to reclaim it and they never returned as well. So yeah, I just that's very interesting. I can't remember his name. Oh, Ariane. Okay. So, cool. Yeah, that's one. Sorry. Yeah. Little factoid from Johnny. Everybody give him some applause. Anyway, so so next, okay. Now no now, now before we get going as to what what happens in a doom, okay? I, I want to introduce everybody to the, actually the concept of plate tectonics, okay? This is what, this is our current understanding of how plates shift on the earth and move around, okay? It's not, it's not a meteor impacting the earth and splitting up continents all over the place, okay? It's a very passive event, passive type of process that occurs over hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, okay? I mean, if, some, if basically, if a meteorite did crash into Earth and basically split the continents, there'd be no more Earth left. It'd be so huge and so dense that it won't, you know, there'd be nobody left to record any kind of events <laughs> or any kind of planet left. So I, I just want to let, I just want to say that first. Uh, so basically in plate tectonics, there's, there's basically three different types of plate margins. What you have is a subduction zone, which, which is a critical, uh, which is a kind of a critical type of margin that, that I'll use to kind of, you know, put the Doom of Valeria in context. Then you have these transform zones, which is uh, basically two plates sliding relative to one another with not much vertical offset. And then you have these things called spreading zones, okay, where, um, where basically plates are, are being pulled apart as opposed to coming together. So subduction zones, plates are coming together. Transform zones, plates are sliding along one another. Okay, and then spreading and spreading zones where plates are actually pulling apart and new materials being formed. Uh, so the spreading zone is actually, uh, you know, the spreading zone we see that in, in the Atlantic, right? It's the it's what the mid oceanic ridge is that that big structural feature that you see in, in topographic maps along the seafloor is you know a spreading center. So basically, magma is coming up, you know, coming up, you know, coming up through the through the spreading center. And basically, just basically building rock. Uh, in the in the Pacific, what you see is a ring of of trenches and oceanic arches, arcs, uh, volcanic arcs that basically make up these subduction zones, and that and that's where oceanic crust is basically uh, subducting underneath less dense continental crust, and you form volcanoes behind it, and also you no know, big trenches. Uh, the purple zone is is occasionally referred to as the Ring of Fire. And it's basically, you know, along these subduction zones. The reason why is that, you know, you create a lot of volcanic activity and earthquakes. And transform zones are basically, you know, these plates are sliding up against one another. And that's what you see in the San Andreas Fault uh, in California. That's an example of a transform zone. So, 
So anyway, that's the Earth in a nutshell, right? So it's basically you create stuff, you pull apart plates, you subduct stuff, you destroy plates, and plates slide along one another. In all in all instances, in general, you know you are you are adhering to the principle of conservation of mass, right? You're not actually creating new material. You're creating new material and destroying stuff at the same time. So no magic involved in this whatsoever. So if you go to the next slide, uh, let's talk about spreading centers here for a minute. Uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to just going to show one little uh, analog, and that's in the Westeros. Essentially, if you look at Westeros, it's a really you know, long continent, about 3,500 meters long. And if you look at the map to the uh, left hand right hand side here, the narrow sea is actually a spreading center right now, right? Because you can kind of see how Essos, the western portion of Essos, kind of fits the eastern portion of Westeros, sort of like you know how uh, the South America kind of fits Africa. Uh, so we think that's a, we So basically, if you kind of look at this present day and kind of extrapolate out into the future, the narrow sea is probably expanding, right? The, the continents are being pulled apart more and more and more. And you can, and that analog is similar to what's happening uh, right now, what happened with the Atlantic and the Pacific, essentially uh, the bottom left-hand corner shows uh, kind of like uh, 250 million years ago, we had this big supercontinent called Pangaea, and then you basically start pulling apart the plates relative to one another, and uh, eventually, uh, today, you basically have, you know, what you know, you basically have the present-day positions of North, South, you know, America, Africa, and Europe. Uh, if you go back to the previous map, I think what you can deduce you should be able to, to deduce is that the Atlantic is growing and the Pacific is shrinking right now. Okay, so so just like the narrow sea is growing and the sunset sea probably is shrinking somewhere. And that's why you have all the volcanic activity in the Pacific more than the Atlantic, correct? Yep, that's right. Yeah, so if you go back to the map, uh, the platonics map earlier on, you kind of see the Atlantic is pulling apart, so it's actually getting larger and larger and everything is being squeezed in the in the Pacific especially along the western margin the Pacific all right yeah. pretty cool right so now my favorite topic are subduction zones okay uh, because that really plays into the uh, whole Duma Valera scenario here and uh, this yellow portion again is this ring of fire Okay, again, lots of volcanic activity, lots of earthquakes. Uh, you get you get large, you know, earthquakes. Obviously, in Mexico City, you know, in Mexico, we had a 7.1 earthquake late you know, last year, last summer. And I think we had an, we had an earthquake just recently, about a couple of weeks ago, in Bali, and Indonesia. That was an 8.0 earthquake. Right along the low subduction zone here. So uh, essentially, in these subduction zones, what you have is that you have a higher density oceanic crust, right? Oceanic crust is higher density because it contains, it contains more iron and magnesium, basically subducting underneath a less dense continental crust. Con continental crust generally, generally are more um, predominantly, predominantly composed of like aluminum and silica, which are you know, less dense elements. So basically, it dives underneath it. And what happens that is going as it goes down, you know, at the forefront of where it starts to go down, you develop these really big um, trenches. And a trench like this would be something like the Marianas Trench, which can extend down to like five miles or even deeper. And as the oceanic crust basically dives down, it gets heated, right? Because we're getting closer and closer to the core of the earth the oceanic crust will melt, okay, then it'll turn into magma, right? It'll melt, turn into magma, and it'll rise up through the continental crust, incorporating some of that rock, and then until it starts to develop areas of pressure, which ultimately, ultimately becomes volcanoes as it's trying to get out to the surface. So really, volcanoes are just a result of density differences of uh, materials going up through the, the Earth's crust. Like, honestly, it's like a pimple. Yeah, it's a big pimple, yeah. 
Yeah. It's a big pimple. Yeah. yeah. That's a good analogy. Yeah, it's interesting because it, it causes a, you know, once they get stuck too, that's when you're at the point of that big earthquake because then they break apart really fast and you cause that, that motion and, well, yeah, keep on yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, so volcanoes are pimples. <laughs> Great analogy. So, it's yeah, and it's formed by, you know, subduction as opposed to puberty or whatever. <laughs> or hormones <laughs> so uh yeah anyway so so, th so that's the subduction zone and basically now i'm going to walk through the actual valerian peninsula and the volcanoes that formed around there so uh so what what happens here okay so let's go look back at doom of valeria 400 you know 400 years ago you know before the events of the uh Game of Thrones, right? And what the Titanic setting was. Essentially, what we had, if you go look at that lower right-hand corner, is that you had an intact Valyrian Peninsula. And then in that dashed, in that dashed black box, you had what was known as the 14 Flames, which was basically a, tr a chain of 14 volcanoes, right? Okay, so around east to west, Okay, and it indicated that's probably a large fault and subduction zone that exists to the south, right? Because, because if this if this is a chain of volcanoes, then the subduction zone has has to be further to the south, okay? Around the trench area offshore. So now, if you if you look at the now if you look at the map itself, and basically if you take a look at the cross section from A to A prime, A to A prime. On the block diagram, you kind of see the kind of relative locations of everything. So basically, A would be offshore, right, in, in the oceanic crest region. Then you have this black line here of the arrows pointing north, okay, that, that indicates the subduction zone, which is the trench. And then you have the volcanoes right behind it, which is where the 14 flames used to be. Okay, yeah. Okay. We're about to go into when they exploded, right? I was just going to ask you, you know, if you could explain why Volantis didn't get hit with a tidal it'll be, wave. It'll be two, it'll be two more slides. Oh, good. Good. Be two more slides. Yeah. So, uh, but I wanted to go through the observations as to what happened in, in the, um, during the Doom of Valeria, right? So the first observation is obviously volcanism, right? But, you know, the quote, from the books that, you know, on the day of the doom, every hill for 500 miles has split asunder to fill the earth, ash, and smoke and fire. That's obviously a volcanic eruption, you know, uh, described in more eloquent terms than what I'm used to in textbooks, but, you know, George R. R. Martin is an eloquent man, right? So, uh, they, uh, the first thing I can say is that, you know, what we can observe from the books is that, you know, yeah, a wall of water 300 feet high had descended upon the Isle Cedars, okay, that's on that map on the on the upper portion of the slide there, that's the Isle of Cedars, okay. Um, while the city of Atlantis to the northwest right here was spared the same fate. So so there was a, there appeared to be a big tidal wave in the Isle of Cedars and not much happened in Atlantis. Now get into why that was the case, because I mean, I mean, you would think that both of them, both of those would be affected the same way since they're equidistant from the 14 flames, but, uh, there's reasons why it would not be affected in the same way. A uh, little picture here of Krakatoa in 1883 showing a big explosion offshore. Uh, so, so what it means is that you know if 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 there was a wall of water 300 feet high that landed upon you know that landed on the Isle of Cedars, it suggests that you know there was some big explosion that happened near Slavers near Slavers Bay around to the south where the volcanoes were. Uh, so the implications for all this, as described in the books, right, was that there was this series of eruptions along the 14 flames that had to have been triggered somehow. Okay, and however, you know, I'll get into I'll get into this in, later on, but it's really difficult to to reconcile this event in terms of what we know because of the scale and distance um, affected. 
you know, by you no know, between the fourteen flames makes these things really makes the situation really unlikely. But you know, a a theory is that you had the fourteen flames all connected, you know, basically as a chain of volcanoes, and then you had this big common magma chamber. So everything exploded at once, essentially, you know, from this common magma chamber and uh, blew up. But again, I'm gonna talk about that later because that's that can't happen, okay? In terms of in terms of the time scale that we're looking at, which is like days or months, right? I mean, it could happen during millions of years, but that's later. Uh, the second observation is, you know, yeah, we have earthquakes and tidal waves, right? The hill splitting asunder obviously means that, you know, we get these big landslides happening. And you can see this, this is like in Chile, where you have this big old landslide coming down into a town at the base of the hill. And then basically waves in the seas, you know, the waves the sea whipped and churned, okay? That's pretty much indicates more of like, like a lot of uh, seismic activity in the water, creating tidal waves. And uh, if you look at this little map here, this is where Johnny's question about the tidal waves come to play here. Uh, what really affects the magnitude and development of tidal waves is, you know, is really more about current direction and sea sea bottom or water bottom topography. If you have a lot of barriers or a very rude ghost water bottom, okay, it can basically inhibit the development of these big tidal waves. So, you know, while Volantis and Al Cedars were, you know, equidistant from the actual epicenter of the volcanic eruption, um, you know, more than likely the Al Cedars, it was a very, you know, a very, very flat water bottom. And basically, you were able to create these big tidal waves hitting the Al Cedars, whereas to the northwest of Volantis, it could have been a lot more rugose or it could have been counter to the prevailing current, okay, of the Sunset Sea, and you inhibit the development of these big tidal waves. And, and that's why Volantis wasn't really affected that much by this, and the Al Cedars was. A lot of it has to do with circulation, current, and uh, you know, water bottom topography. Yeah, also some natural features such as, well, I don't know if I would call them eddies or, you know, things that stick up in the topography uh, definitely help. And a deeper water, you know, just lots would dissipate the wave, I would think. So, yeah, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, so so, so local, local conditions definitely can, you know, impact and dictate where these big tidal waves are going to hit. So... You know, Volantis, Tolo, Solaria, you know, all survived the doom intact, you know, even despite being close proximity to the waves, you know, and, you know, and the eruptions didn't really affect them at all as well, right? So it just proves to show you that volcanic events are, are going to be more localized in nature just because you have a big super volcano in, you know, in the Pacific. You, you won't feel it in Europe or Asia, right, or something like that. It's, I mean, these are really more local events that happens. Um, and you also get these really big deep-seated earthquakes along these subduction zones, um, and you know, which will create these large tidal waves. And a really tragic event was in Thailand 2004, where like tens of thousands of people died because there was an earthquake that happened out, you know, out in the ocean, but it just created this big tidal wave that just basically flooded the uh, Thailand coast back then. I was about to ask you a question, but it's on the next slide, so. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so, uh, so let's go into the third observation, which is the smoking sea business, right? Um, you know, Daenerys and her infinite wisdom. Yeah, there's no smoking sea because Valeria is not yet an island. Fine, you know, it's, it's somewhat connected still. So I'll, I'll give it to her for now. Uh, but, uh, but basically, basically, if you look at the cross section of a volcano, okay, which is what I have right here, is that you have this uh, kind of the magma chamber is coming up, okay, it's building pressure and eventually it's gonna it's gonna erupt right through the vent right or the the tip of the volcano, and as it erupts and then dies down, you form this thing called a caldera up on top. So that that's a remnant. That's actually a remnant of the actual volcanic event. Okay, the calderas could be inactive or active, but they're, you know, but it's there. And where where this caldera can actually start emitting, you know, you'll be emitting volcanic gases and whatever through this caldera. 
So uh, the smoke and see itself, you know, I mean, if that if this was part of the 14 flames at one point and they did erupt all at once, you would basically form a chain of volcano uh, of calderas associated with each of those flames, and you know these calderas could be exposed as seamounts um, above the water, right? They're not actually underground. Like if you go to Hawaii or whatever, you get these things called seamounts where you have these basically um, little pieces of rocks that gas is escaping through. You can actually see like clouds of gas escaping through above the uh, ocean surface, and that's you know, we call them sea mounts there on a small scale, but you can have the same kind of thing going on in the smoke and sea. Uh, and, you know, these active calderas can have volcanic volcanic gas emissions, and volcanic gas contains a lot of uh, sulfur. Okay, you mix that in with hydrogen, okay, from the water, from, like, basically steam from the ocean. You can create, under, under the right circumstances, create hydrogen sulfide, which is a very deadly gas. So... Maybe that's what's happening, you know, as ships are cruising through these, the smoke and sea, you know, the crew is inhaling hydrogen sulfide and dying. I mean, we see that all the time in oil fields. It's called sour gas in oil fields, but it's the same thing. It's very colorless, very, uh, you can't smell it. And well, you can smell it. It smells like rotten eggs. But if you can, if you cannot smell it, that means you're pretty much dead because it's in a high enough concentration where you can't smell it anymore because it kills your nose nerves and uh, yeah it's a pretty deadly gas I have a question pertaining to that and like seismic activity in the area of the Smoke Sea and the Chiroin River uh, you know when Tyrion and Young Griff and Griff were on the raft and they went through and they passed under the bridge twice uh, a lot of people are thinking it's a time loop but Bubba made a good point in 1811 uh, according to the the National Geological Survey, after the New Madrid earthquakes happened, the Mississippi ran backwards for a few hours. Now, this was, I don't know if this is true, but this is what I've seen in reports. Is, is that a possibility of seismic activity? The, 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 what, the time loop? The what? The no, the current of a river. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's happened before. The, uh, I think it was 1825, it was, it was like a New, New Madrid fault. It was like, like in the shores of Memphis, Tennessee. I mean, that, that was like about an 8.0 8 .0 earthquake or something like that. It was, it's like the largest uh, earthquake ever experienced on the continental U.S. You know, or been recorded by humans, right? And uh, that actually did temporarily divert the flow of the Mississippi, where it went north instead of flowed south. Yeah, and shout out to Bubba for sending me that question. Uh, appreciate yeah. it, Bubba. Yeah, yeah, and also, dog. I mean, uh, you're, you're right. I mean, the reason why it's called it smelled sour, it's called sour gas, is because you can smell it. It smells like rotten eggs, but that's at a really low concentration. Once you, <laughs> once you know, that's the saying goes that if you can smell it, you got time to run away. If you can't smell it, you're dead, because at a high, at a high enough concentration, it'll just burn your nose vessels and your sense of smell. That you're just gone. You're wiped out. Yeah, that's yeah, it's that's dangerous stuff. Like really scary, man. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, in the uh, in West Texas, there's you know, it's a big deal. It's really a big deal. So, uh, so everybody in the chat, avoid you know drilling deep West Texas oil fields, or make sure you have gas masks on site. <laughs> I was gonna see if Kenzie had a question. Well, Texas. Um, there was a question from a while ago, and I think it was from Bubba, and he was like, is that why, um, wait, hold on, uh, is this, didn't Germ say that the planet containing Westeros was called Earth? I think so. It might have been in an interview that he did when someone asked, but I think that was. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, no, I think I read that article once, and... Uh, I think what George R.M. meant was that it's not called Earth. It was more like if somebody was going to refer to their planet as something, it'll be just like how we would call it Earth. They would call it just like we would Earth. And then the other, <laughs> and then the other question from Moni was: Is there a chance that there could be blue lava? If blue lava was a thing, unless. 
I, I don't know. I, I've, I only saw kind of like a bright yellowish red lava. <laughs> I, I, I can't. Maybe under certain, a certain chemical composition, you can have blue lava, perhaps. Maybe there was a lot of chromium or something like that. <laughs> I, no, honestly, I, I don't know. Yeah, the, 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 glue, the glow when it got really hot. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, and then yeah. there was just a bunch of trolling after that. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, th this whole plantos thing is weird because, you know, as I, as I mentioned in the intro, n there's nowhere in a book that actually mentions planetos. It's, it's, it's a fan created phenomenon. So, uh, because I checked it yesterday because we had this discussion after Johnny's stream with everybody else, with Eduardo and Johnny and the other Johnny. And they said, you know, I don't think plantos has ever been mentioned in the books. And evidently, that was right. It never has been. Everybody just calls it that because they don't know what else to call it, right? And it sounds cool. And uh, you'll see that it looks a lot like just like yeah. East, like Europe and Africa, and like mm -hmm. yeah, the correlations are just too strong. Mm -hmm. It's probably called Planetos because yeah. George probably had mentioned it at one point, and it's like call it whatever you want. Because then people also wanted to call it Earth Oaks at one point. I was like, mm, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know either. I mean, in terms of the blue lava thing, I think some people are saying that they've seen blue lava. Perhaps, you know, I mean, in a flame, a flame burns blue, right, when it's really hot. Sulfur burns blue when it's really hot. Well, no, when it burns, right, when it ignites, it turns blue. But a lava is kind of a liquid, so we're, we're past the burning stage, right? We're kind of like in the heated liquid, solid stage. I don't know. Maybe there is blue blue lava, and perhaps it's you know it's going to be related to some kind of chemical composition thing where you might have a lot of copper or a lot of chromium in there that can make it blue. So I, I know I I've never seen blue lava. <laughs> It'd be trippy, huh? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Go yeah. ahead. Unless we got any more questions from the chat. Go All right. Um, we got no. We got okay. So 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 so. So those are the observations about the smoke about the Demon Valeria. So let let's get into the integration here now. Can could could this really happen on Earth? <laughs> you know, could could a landmass be separated by the simultaneous eruption of volcanic of volcanoes? And can there really be a simultaneous eruption of volcanoes that can separate a, la a landmass? Well, the first thing I want to say is that really there hasn't been any analogs in in the earth's geologic record okay as far as i know and i've been doing this for a while now so, uh, of this happening okay so that's the first thing okay so there's no analog in the earth's geologic record of something like this happening where you have simultaneous eruption and a landmass just basically falling into the sea okay uh so and the reason why, okay, is that th the scale of this event is so large, right? The Valerian Pen Peninsula is about 500 miles wide, okay, and 700 miles long, right? So you had to have basically fractured 500 miles okay, of rock and have that, all that stuff fall into the ocean. And the actual crust itself is about 19 to 44 miles thick. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a really, really massive event for this to happen, and we just can't see that. You know, given the time frame, given the time scale of which this event actually occurred in, which is like, you know, a couple of days to a month, right, or whatever George Martin said. Uh, on the Earth itself, right, these, the largest crowd, calderas are about 35 to 60 miles across. Okay, so if you had 14 flames and you, 14 individual volcanoes, and you multiply it by roughly about 35 to 60 miles, okay, you, you'll have about 490 to 840 miles of calderas, okay? So you can create something like this, okay, realistically, where you have a chain of 14 volcanoes, you know, and composed of these really big calderas, okay? But they'll, ha but they'll all have to erupt at once again, right? Which is really unlikely, so... Um, unless you stretch kind of like the laws of earth physics and say that it's one big humongous magma chamber and it just basically just erupted all at once and it was so it was just so big and you know so destructive that it basically penetrated and broke through you know 44 miles of crust and then everything slid and slid into the sea so um 
So uh, a good example of what I'm talking about in terms of scale and in terms of time scales and distance uh, can actually be found like in Yellowstone. This is one of these analogs that I've been trying to find for a while now. And what you see here is a chain of volcanoes that's basically been, been forming and migrating, forming to the, to the northeast, okay, uh, through the past you know, 20 million years or so. So the red one here, if you can see my cursor, is the present day Yellowstone caldera kind of has been forming. And this white one here is the oldest caldera in the region, okay? And and pay attention to what I'm saying next, okay? So it's, things are getting younger to the northeast, but if you look at the timing of these volcanic, of the volcanoes and when they erupted, we're looking at, you know, 60 million years from the time the first volcano erupted and down to about 600,000 years ago for the last volcano to erupt. Okay, so we're looking at about 16 or 15 and a half million years of activity just to form this chain of chain of volcanoes that's roughly the same, roughly on the same, roughly on the order of the same distance as the 14 flames, about 500 miles. In this case, the Yellowstone chain of volcanoes is about 450 miles, and that takes 60 million years. And then the book is saying it takes two days, right, or a month. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, that's some serious. Well, you know, that's a serious super volcano, and yeah, yeah, you're making a lot of. It takes a lot of time to build up that pressure, but what you're talking about isn't even that much time in geological time. So, like, what we see as time is a little bit skewed. Yeah, yeah geologic, geologic time is. You know, we're talking millions of years is nothing in geologic times, right? In in the book, in the way to describe it, in natural events, right? It happens, you know, in a couple of days, you know. Or a month or so, you know. And I'm just trying to say that there's no, there's no example that says it can happen in a couple of days or a month. <laughs> to, you know, to basically develop this these, this chain of calderas that extends out 500 miles across the uh, Valerian Peninsula. Right. That's. But yeah, it would take such, such a massive amount of pressure, and yeah, like I was saying earlier, with the mat, it would have to be boiling point or nexus point of magic to, yeah. at that point because yeah, yeah. fireworms there was they were releasing pressure every time they mined so it doesn't make sense for the pressure to build up like nope, that nope nope i mean if they're releasing pressure continuously then you won't be building up as much uh active you won't be building up enough pressure to actually make a big old you know catastrophic explosion you know, and people can say, you know, and they've always done it, that it was some kind of magic that the faceless men did. You know, they went down there and they basically made all the volcanoes erupt all at once. You know, all, you know, all 14 of them <laughs> go off at the same time, which, which is some super serious dynamite, right? <laughs> or there was a dragon in there, you know, down below, you know, breathing a bunch of fire and stuff like that. You know, basically superheating, you know, the magma chambers. That would work. Yeah, you know, it's all sorts of stuff, you know, but at the end of the day, there, we have no evidence of this kind of feature forming, okay, given the time, you know, given the time scale that George R. Martin describes in the books. And even then, if a feature like this formed, could it be big enough to fracture, you know, 500 miles of Valerian Peninsula of Continental Crest? Okay. There was, I guess, a um, Eduardo came in with like a, I guess, somewhat explanation for blue lava. Okay. Um, cool. It says, uh, the emission spectrum of chromium is blue indeed, but blue lava is an optical illusion caused by the blue flames emitted from copper, copper, chromium, magnesium, and sulfur. There you go. <laughs> yeah, 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 it could be just optical illusion, yeah. I mean, you and then, seen this uh, red. <laughs> and then uh, LMR has a question of, do you think they have different elements in Westeros, like the ones that are missing from our periodic table, if any are missing? Um, I, I have no idea. I, I can't answer that question because really, you know, the, the chemistry of planetos or just a world of ice and fire, whatever you want to call it, hasn't really been you know, uh, delved into. I mean, we know that they have, they have bronze, so we know that they have like copper and, you know, 
what's the other thing for bronze? Copper and iron, or co it's an alloy of something. Right. Uh, copper and nickel, some of that. You yeah. know, so we know that those basic elements, we know they have gold, we know that they have silver, right? Uh, so so maybe the base, the base classical metals that they would have. So um, if that's the case, maybe they do have sulfur and everything else. Maybe it is similar. I don't know. Didn't at that time, didn't they have steel as well? I mean, they had all the components to make steel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they had iron, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, the Roynar, not is it the Roynar that probably, they had steel first that we know of? Yeah. Huh? yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 the thing, and, the thing, and the thing is that, you know, as what's been described in the World of Ice and Fire, or, you know, in the whole saga, is that they seem to be using the same kind of metals that we use on Earth, right? So... You know, I mean, more than likely, I'm, I bet you it's probably the same type of elements, same kind of elements. I mean, they, they never described a element, a magical element that we don't have on Earth. That makes sense. Right. I mean, even even Valyrian steel, right, that's an alloy, right, special alloy. It's not an element, right, and it's probably made by Dragonfire and Blood Sacrifice. Some kind of alloy. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I mean, there's magic in there, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I can't, I mean, I don't remember seeing anything about any kind of special element that the world of Planetos has that Earth can have. I just want to say, like, all the animals, except for lizard lions, just about, and dragons, all the animals are pretty much what's in our world. All the geographical spectrums, where the people are geographically, the races of people that are geographically, is so close to Earth that I, I just feel like yeah. writing about a parallel Earth or something, at least, you know. Yeah. Um, I guess I guess one last point I wanted to make was that you know th there's been some theories about where or not it, could we have a meter impact and that could be big enough to basically separate out, separate out that large piece of landmass. And the answer is no, because again, I guess to my point where. Something that big to, to basically fracture a 500 miles of continental crust, which is about you know 40 miles thick, you're you're gonna blow up the whole area or pretty close to the whole world with something that big. Okay, I mean even the biggest meteorite that we know of, that 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 landed sometime in the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary, right, the, the event that killed the dinosaurs, okay, didn't it wasn't big enough to destroy like you know or separate continental or oceanic crust. So, what happened there, it probably was magic, right? I mean, I'm sure there's a mix of science in there that we can explain, like the formation of volcanoes and whatever. But in order to compress the timeline, you got to have magic in there. That's described in the books. Yeah, Arkham's Riser theory is just that I'm not ever using built up until it exploded. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh... If there's no more questions about the Doom of Valeria, we can get into the break of the Armored Dorn, which, which I...